Uh, today on the Serbone Theory, we have ourselves Phil Patterson Jr. Uh, you're a, you're a seasoned veteran in these uh, ultra marathon runs, and and uh, we're, we're looking to you for a little bit of help here to to kind of help out a couple of new newbies in this sport. All right. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we wanted to we wanted to do a little introduction about you. you have uh, your podcast out that is the uh, is the mile you're in podcast, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and uh, you you've done what I think is six. You're a six time hundred hundred mile finisher. Six times, yes. That's awesome, that's right. man. That's amazing. Oh my! Yeah. <laughs> we just finished up our first fifty January, and that was like that was a grueling like that was a grueling adventure all on its own. <laughs> so <laughs> we're trying to level up like that, but it's we're, we're getting right. there slowly. <laughs> and that was that was skydive, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. You did that one, right? Did, Oh man, your your <laughs> weather was way better than ours. Trust me, way better. <laughs> Thank God, man. Thank God. But you, I mean, you got through that. It was during a tropical depression. Yeah, so it was it was supposed to be cold. That was all all that was expected. Cold weather, a little bit of rain. Um, the the first I want to say twelve hours, it was fine, and <laughs> then it hit. So. The, the storm was supposed to actually hit Miami because the same weekend was the Miami Marathon. Uh, so oh, all wow. my friends were freaking out like, oh, they're going to get slammed, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, oh, we're good up here. Nope, it came north. So it hit us and Miami had the perfect weather. And that's a story in itself. Man. It was crazy. <laughs> you made it through. That was like, well, I'm sure we're going to get to that. I definitely want to hear that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But uh, if you want to in, uh, introduce yourself a little bit and kind of uh, tell us why you started your podcast. And uh, how you got into ultra running a little bit. Yeah, so I actually started running in uh, June of 2013. Um, funny story was it was I was up late one night. Um, I want to say it was like one, two in the morning. I just could not go to sleep. Yeah. And I know from from my experience when I work out or do any kind of exercise, I get tired, then I fall asleep. So I say, you know what, let me just go for a run and wear myself out. Um, <laughs> But me being a statistic type person, I took my phone with me, downloaded an app real quick, huh. went for the run. Um, nothing crazy, just just smooth, um, slow pace. Came back and I was like, man, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So that's what really, to be honest, got me into running is trying to go to sleep one night and realizing I wasn't as out of shape as I thought I was. <laughs> um, and then from there, I actually that helped me lose 90 pounds at one point. I've Whoa. put some of that weight back. Yeah. But what I was, were, what were you starting out at? What was the, what were, what were you weighing at that point? I was at two thirty at that oh, point. Wow, man. Yeah. Cause at that back then it was, my cardio was basketball and mm. I did a lot of weightlifting. So I was more like a, a bigger bulkier guy. Yeah. So it wasn't really like, necessarily overweight it was just that weight was affecting like back spasms and, and hips and knees and stuff like that do you uh so is that like did you have like prior history of running or, or any like other athletics that you did while you were younger or? in in high school i wrestled so they did make us run a lot yeah. um which we hated but it was it wasn't too bad because wrestling matches are typically six minutes or less so you didn't have to run more than maybe one to two miles um so that's why I knew I could do about one to two miles, especially playing basketball on a consistent basis, running up and down the court. Um, and it's just as, as I lost weight, it got easier. I got faster. Um, and then I said, oh, you know, it's getting boring running around these same spots. Let's <laughs> spice it up a little bit. And then I started doing races and, you know, you do a couple races and you're like, all right, what, what's next? And you know, the 5Ks led to half marathons, to <laughs> 50Ks, to 100 milers. And, and that's where I'm cutting my limit, though. 100 milers. Uh, you say it. that now. You say <laughs> that. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're not even there yet. But I, I, would, I would really like to see what a 100 miler, and that's also what I want to get into is kind of like your ideas about, like, what you have to do and mentally and physically prepare for for a 100 miler. Because I feel like that's a big difference between like a 50 and a hundred because you're running for 24 plus right, right. right so right. i mean it's like no sleep you got to keep refueling you got to keep talking to yourself like okay keep going keep going but uh so i mean what is there like your cardio is always pretty on point i mean not ultra marathon status but when you're, you're growing up you did a lot of athletics and stuff like that yeah. we we grew up doing football and nick did a little bit of wrestling and yeah. stuff like that in high school 
we did weightlifting and <clears throat> I think it was, I think it was more of like a, like a more of like a challenge upon ourselves. Like, would you say that's why most people get into ultra running is to kind of just like push your boundaries a little bit? Yeah, I think because it's, I don't necessarily, unless you're an elite runner mm -hmm. and even then they might disagree. I don't want to say it's ever easy, mm -hmm. but you know, for me, it was, you're doing the distance so much that at least for me, it got boring. It's like, okay, what, what else can I do? Um, you know, yeah, you could go faster, but I didn't, I don't have that kind of drive to, to break all these times. It's yeah. more of like that distance is a thrill. Like how far can I go? And then I, I, that. I had that same mentality. Like, I mean, because there are those same type of people that like, they're like marathoners or people that do just five K's and half marathons, or they're going to beat their time. And that's great. I mean, I do that occasionally too, but it's that mileage that really like hits that switch for me. I don't know why it's, it just seems cooler. Like, I don't I, It's just, it's something, I don't know. But, uh, I mean, how do you, uh, I, you said that you have a, a, a child, a daughter or son, uh, one, one year old son. Yeah. One year old son. Congratulations. And it was your, your birthday recently, right? Uh, three. Yeah. The 30th of May. So uh, time's flying already. I think it's two weeks. Now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and happy birthday. Happy belated Thank birthday. You. Thank yeah. you. But how do you uh, how do you balance like your t because I know just a fifty mile that we did that took like a heck of a lot of training a heck of a lot of time you got to go out there and put two three hours worth or an hour's worth of training and then you got to kind of balance everything else out between maybe doing a little bit of uh, eating properly and kind of not going out and maybe especially at our age everybody wants to go out and party and stuff like that you kind of have to like say no to that because i gotta run you know but how do you balance that between like your family life and stuff like that this year has been tough mm -hmm. um so last year i i well last year i did three of them but right towards the end of the year before that was my first so i was able to cram the first four in while my son you know my wife was still pregnant um and then she had a premature birth. So he was actually in the hospital. And, and this is another funny story is he was in the hospital for 102 days. So it's kind of like that number 100 just mm -hmm. follows me everywhere. It keeps hitting you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, while he was in the hospital, it, it, I was able to keep my normal routine. Mm -hmm. um, and we managed it when he was still like in that infant stage. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, my wife could handle it more. Uh, but now with, you know, both of us working from home because of the COVID situation uh, and then him now being more mobile, he can walk now, he's grabbing everything. So you have to be, it's not like you could just put him down in a crib and not worry about him. He's all over the place. So mm -hmm. that's been like um, kind of training in a way because you're, you're picking him up all the time and, and picking up stuff that he makes a mess with you're walking around the house way more than you normally do, which is actually good for ultras because the more time on your feet is necessary is, is actually better. Um, but it's been tough. Just like I haven't run as much as I normally do mm -hmm. for these. Um, and that's why this most recent one was the, uh, the hardest in my opinion, but you just, any chance you get, like I try to squeeze runs in on my lunch break. Um, you know, before they, my wife and, and son wake up, um, I try to squeeze some in at night if they go to sleep early. So you really just find any chance you get and, and try to get as much time on your feet as you can. If you really love something like a passion, you're like you are passionate, obviously for the sport and everything else that you do, you got to fit it in between your responsibilities. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my, it's, it's funny you say that my wife, uh, I think it was like four or five days after I had did the hundred for my birthday, I said, ah, I think I'm going to um, just test my legs out and my lungs out tomorrow. And she goes, what person runs a hundred miles and then looks forward to their next run? Like, shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't you not want to run for a while? And I was like, it's, it's the passion. You just want to yeah. get back out there again. Mm -hmm. so. I, I see it as like a, I don't know. It's, it's a, I mean, especially I know in one of your podcasts, you talk a lot about uh, a mental awareness, right? Yeah. And mental health. And, and I think that a lot of people, and I, I, think that you would probably agree that a lot of people can get out of maybe not ultra running, but just like running in general, if you kind of get yourself out there and you don't have any music on you at times, or maybe you're just, you're kind of like seeing things, it's a freeing experience. You're not looking at four walls. 
um, you kind of you kind of get at you kind of get out of your body a little bit or out of your mind a little bit and into your body. Yeah, and you said it's like a like a moving meditation almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got I got a good friend who he he says it best. He says if you wanna if you wanna experience with and to talk to God, mm-hmm. do a hundred miler because <laughs> <laughs> you get to that point. It's like you try everything and then eventually it's just like all right what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Lead me the way. Yeah. <laughs> Lead the way, man. <laughs> That's cool. That's really cool. Um, how do you, uh, how do you prepare for something like a, uh, a 24 hour race? Cause like, I don't really know how to, how to, cause we're thinking about doing, and I think you did it. The key is 100. Yeah. Now, yeah. now what, like, uh, how do you prepare for something that you're going to go for 24 hours? There's something that you did to prepare yourself mentally, physically. Did you try to maybe try to stay up all night one time and just do miles and then relax and then do a couple more miles or is there some way that you prepared? Yeah. So there's, uh, I believe it's, I believe his name is David Goggins. Yeah. Yes. yeah we know <laughs> David Goggins. <laughs> so he has that, I think it, it's, it's like he does four miles every four hours or something like that. Yeah. I think yeah. So I, at the time I didn't have a way of doing that. My schedule just, I worked the retail running store. So the schedule was always different. There was no way I was going to make that happen. So what I did was I said, I'm going to go every, every other hour. And mm-hmm. and then I still got you. We lost you for a second. You were going to run every okay. other hour? Yeah. So I was going to run every other hour um, for 24 hours because that was the best. That way it would give me some time to recover. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But also that would give me 24 hours of trying to stay awake and keep moving. Mm-hmm. Um, also, because there will be times you might have to take a break. Mm-hmm. That That gave me the opportunity to kind of experience stopping and starting multiple times okay um so that i didn't end up doing the full 24 hours uh just because it, mentally i kind of quit on myself um but i felt like i got enough experience from that to take me where i wanted to in the next step uh-huh. but when that you- was kind of the whole thing is trying to see how long i could stay awake stopping and starting um things like that and I think you were going to ask this question about the like certain techniques that you would do. Yeah. So we, um, s- since we've only done like two ultras pretty much, we, we did like a 50 K unofficial, just like ourselves, just trying it out. And then our first one was the skydive ultra 50 miler. And we noticed when we did the 50 miler, a lot of people were doing this walk run technique and we, we never seen this before. Never we kind of, we kind of just took a break like at every checkpoint. So can you sort of explain like, these tech the, the walk run technique yeah so um because i i worked my way up it was you know after i did a few marathons then it was a 50k then it was a 50 miler um my big mistake was not at least trying 100k in between that so i went straight from a 50 miler to a 100 miler mm-hmm. um but it was it was actually during the 50k that i i same thing i i started look because in marathons you don't really see it mm-hmm. except for maybe like if you're doing an out and back, you see some of the people that are more towards the back, they have that technique. Okay. Um, and, and the 50 K I was, I noticed a lot of people were doing, and then I realized because the one I was doing had a lot of incline, I noticed people were walking the inclines and then running the flat and downs. Oh, okay. So it was, there's a lot of um, game plan changing that goes on. So originally mine was I would run, or I would walk the first minute of the mile and then run through the rest. But then I realized my body couldn't handle that for a full hundred. And then I just started saying, okay, I'm going to run when I can walk when I have to, and just kept doing that. And I kind of from observing them doing it and, and just going off of feel of my body started doing the same thing and realized you almost, and you know, again, unless you're elite runner, Mm -hmm. just for us average guys that are doing this, um, it ends up balancing out to where you're almost faster because you don't have to take as many breaks because you're not beating yourself up so much of the constant running. Um, so I felt, I feel like it's actually beneficial also mentally. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
right? to not just fatigue yourself so much and kind of you can kind of just when you're at the aid station grab food and keep going right for the, mo- for the most part yeah. right oh that's smart yeah i like that we'll definitely have to i mean i'm sure we're gonna have to try that in our next 100 whatever that may be yeah. but yeah we're definitely thinking about the keys for sure that that, that seems like a fun one yeah just yeah, like, go, go ahead so yeah um I, you live in fort lauderdale correct right and and just real quick to add in i don't know how you want to edit but for the keys my experience train in the hottest part of the day okay like okay. as much as you can that's what i did and people thought i was crazy <laughs> you'll you'll see some elites i haven't taken it this far but they'll go out there with sweatsuits or Whoa. you know cotton <laughs> clothes um and and you probably know from the wrestling days you know mm-hmm. we did that all the time yeah the heat up weight. in the room um you know it's just so that come race day it's not as bad as that yeah your you know, condition so, yeah right so yeah i live in, in fort lauderdale florida yeah, right. yeah. Right. i think um just growing up in south florida it sort of gives us almost an advantage like running in the heat almost um so that's why and just seeing the the keys 100 being in like south florida it would be like i guess a cool first one to do oh, yeah. you know close to home and another thing i wanted to bring up was you've probably done loop races where like, you know, you, you do the loop and then there's one, like a point to point one, like the keys 100. I, I, I feel like the point to point ones are, are kind of almost maybe like a little more intriguing just cause like, you know, you, you're going that distance and you can see that like straight line that you're going down. The, what, what's yeah, your experience behind that? So I, the five of them have been loops and the keys was the only point to point. Um, it takes more planning because okay. you don't have that loop and you don't have your setup. Um, in my case, I didn't even have a crew for the keys. Mm-hmm. Um, so that made oh. it tougher. Yeah. Uh, well, I, are they, do they allow that? They, yeah, they do. Um, I didn't know that. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's crazy. It, man. <laughs> it gets to the point like somewhere I want to say towards the, the night of the first day, some of the other crews start to realize, yo, this guy, this guy or this woman, because there's I've seen a lot of um, solo women runners as well. Uh-huh. They start realizing that we're out there by ourselves and we don't have the help that all these other runners do. So they actually start helping you as well, um, just because they see you're getting beat up. You're struggling. You don't have the help. <laughs> and and there's that sense of you can't just stop when you get back at the end of the loop. Like you said, it's point to point. You're you're going full out. So that kind of drives you more because you don't want to have to now sit there and wait for someone to come pick you up and, and then take you to the finish line where everyone's going to be celebrating and, and mm-hmm. partying. It's like you, you start finding little things to motivate you to just keep yeah. pushing and say, you know what, as long as you're making the cutoffs, it's like, just keep going. Just, just keep moving. That's the key. I think, I think that's like, that's a big thing. And, and you were saying David Goggins, like the, what you've learned from him a little bit. And I think that was our big introduction because we had never heard about ultra running and we heard it through the Joe Rogan podcast and, and David Goggins was on there and he talked about how he was over able to overcome insecurities with this type of running and kind of boost his own like mentality and confidence and resiliency like that. And what would you say you've like gained from like the community or just doing ultras? A lot. I mean, the just to touch on the community first, it's a family. Um, you know, if you guys ever want, especially for the first one, mm-hmm. um, the Wildcat 100 is is perfect in my opinion because most most hundreds give you 32, 30 to 32 hours. This one gives you 40. Um, it's a good cushion. Yeah, and it's in a, it's a nice little loop, but mm-hmm. the family atmosphere out there is just crazy everyone is suffering together (laughs) and we're all just lifting each other's spirits up um and that's what i've noticed the difference between ultras and just the 5ks to marathons is is it's less competitive it's more fun people helping each other because there's times where you know i i didn't my headlamp wasn't working and somebody gave me theirs or you know i fell and someone's picking me up and you know it's the community is just so different in my opinion. Um, a lot of friendships have been made. Um, and then I think just the mental, cause you're, you're going to definitely gain physical strength from doing stuff like this, but the mental aspect of it, I've been able to apply a lot of things f- 
from doing those into life now because yeah. it's like if i could go through that my boss yelling at me or or <laughs> exactly a little bit of stress <laughs> of meeting a deadline at work or you know the little things waiting in line at the fast food restaurant it's like things that used to bother me are slowly getting less annoying to me because it's like i could be out there in this 100 degree weather right now trying to push through mile 50 with 50 to go <laughs> this is easy yeah, <laughs> yeah is, i'm in the ac in my truck <laughs> that's awesome man no i really like that's what i feel like is the big i mean besides the fact of like challenging yourself i feel like that's a big part of it but like the gain that you get because that was our big like into it like we wanted to challenge ourselves and then we got this crazy new resilience and these new uh, uh a bit like just mental strength that came along with it and i think that's what we're really kind of going after now is like like how far can we push ourselves and it's fun to have especially i mean like i like i know about well i've ran by myself before and it's not as fun but like having him there with me the first time was like a really good motivator and we kind of like grew off of each other and I guess when you start going to a community like that, it's just a bigger family at that point. It's, it's, it just gets that much easier or I wouldn't say easier, but it, it's that much more help. Yeah, definitely. Cause it's, you, the more you do, you'll start to meet people and, and, you know, familiar faces and, and everyone's friendly. Like I, I seen a guy at the hundred K I did right before long haul and you know, I was, I recognized him when we started talking and I was encouraging him because this was his first hundred and he's picking my, my brain as we're running one of the loops. And yeah. it's just, that's, that's the difference. You don't really, I feel like you don't get that in other races because people are going harder and faster because it's a shorter distance. It's more of trying to meet these time goals where you're still doing it in an ultra, but most of us that are doing it, we're, we're just out there for that challenge and experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's again, the, the, I think the community really makes it so much more fun because then you see like, especially in the Florida ultra runners group, you see people posting, Hey, I'm doing this race. And it's like, Oh, I'm going to sign up for that race too. You're doing it. I'm <laughs> doing it too. I'll see you out there it, because awesome. you want to be, you, it's that FOMO. You don't want to miss out. Yeah. On the yeah. Fun. Oh, um, uh, you said that your last race, the, the virtual run, the uh, run like a ninja, was it? Yes. And uh, that's that. How was that? compared to and you said that that was one of your hardest race just because you going having a new child and everything like that and having a family to look after now it kind of took away the time that you had to like train as much as you wanted to um but besides that like what was the difference versus like your other races um for sure the heat um it didn't bother me as much um as i might have expressed even in my um, my podcast episode about it it's just that the weather for us at least I feel like in Florida has been cooler a lot longer than it normally is normally it's it, it would be hot and humid a lot earlier in the year so I didn't get the heat training I normally do in the mornings um, and then again last year when I was doing a lot of these I had a different job where I was able to train in the middle of the day where mm -hmm. it was hot where now I could either train in the morning or or at night and I never got the, the same heat trading that I normally do. So what I was trying to do was run with those sweatsuits or, or cotton hoodies, whatever I could do to mimic that. Okay. And it, there's really not the Florida heat just does what yeah. it does to you. Best training. <laughs> um, and then the fact that it was virtual. Um, I did this because the keys 100 got canceled. I was signed up to do that again. Uh -huh. I wanted redemption for my first experience with it, which wasn't bad. It was just, um, I made a lot of mistakes being crewless mm -hmm. that now I, I could plan for. So when I signed up for this, I knew it was going to be more of a mental struggle because there's no one out there. It's just you. Yeah. You know, I had a friend join me for a couple loops, but you're out there by yourself. And, and it's, it was basically in my neighborhood. So you're seeing people having fun not struggling like you're used to <laughs> and and every time i'd come back to my house and and my son and wife are just sitting in the ac hanging out or my neighbors blasting music and i can smell the barbecue and they're i can uh -oh. hear the splash of the pool it's like oh my god like, <laughs> i could just quit do i really need to do this so it was it was just a mental struggle of just get up and start moving because once you start moving it's like okay yeah and then you get halfway through the loop. It's like, okay, you're halfway done with this loop. So it, 
it was more mental to me than physical this time. Yeah, because you had done hundreds before, so you knew you could do it. It was just the fact that like this was different because nobody like you're there by yourself. You're not there's the there's less of a community. Right. And I think that's the nice thing, like you even said, having him there for your first one, no matter how experienced you are, you're gonna each one is gonna be different. Mm-hmm. Um and for me during the second morning, um, I, I was I think I had like twenty four, twenty miles to go. So you're almost there. Basically, (laughs) and and because of the time limit i knew i could even go slower if i wanted and take more breaks and i still was going to make the time so i wasn't worried about that but it was my birthday i wanted to be done and actually enjoy some of my birthday Um, and i told my friend i was like you know what i've done five of these already i've gotten 80 miles in what's the point like and I won't say everything that she said to me, but she told me what I needed to hear and was like, look, you're being, basically you're being stupid right now. Cause you're, you're saying it, but you don't really mean it. And I didn't even believe it as much as I was like, I'm going to quit when I get to the end of this loop. I knew once I sat down and cooled down for a minute, drank something, ate something, I was going to be refreshed mentally and just get back out there. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of battling with yourself and just talking yourself out of the negativity. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's probably a big portion of it too. I think is like self-talk is probably a a big thing in ultras because you got to, you're, you're pretty much battling against yourself. I think most of the time, because you don't want, I mean, you, nobody wants to suffer like that, but it's kind of a necessity a little bit, like just to like, just to be able to thrive through life a little bit, you know, you got, you got to have to suffer to be able to enjoy the good times. Um, Going, going to the self-talk part. Um, was there a race where you got to a point where you, you just absolutely wanted to quit? Just like you wanted to stop and then just like not do it, but you ended up finishing. The, the first one. Um, <laughs> really? Wow. So again, I jumped straight from 50 to 100. Yeah, that's um, a big difference. <laughs> and the funny thing is anyone north of, I want to say Orlando, uh-huh. says everything is, is flat down here any elevation to me, I feel it. I I just, I'm so used to true Florida flat. So they said this race was flat. It ended up being, which people that might listen to this are going to still laugh, but it was like 3000 feet of elevation total, which for me was brutal. I (laughs) I have nowhere to practice for that. So I got up to, I want to say somewhere in the sixties. It was now like one in the morning. And that's the bit, probably the toughest part of of a hundred miler is Mm -hmm. everything gets quiet because now the whole everything is you know it's dark you just see headlamps Mm -hmm. most people are now putting on music or self motivating things to to just get through the night because that's your whole thing is is get through the night because once that sun comes back up you get more life Uh, that's okay we had a we had a we had a gentleman that was saying that and I kind of didn't understand, but he was doing the hundred miler and he kept saying, because just when we were talking to him, he goes, just need to get through the night. Just need to get through the night. Yeah. Because I was like, that's weird. I don't, I don't know why, but I mean, I guess, you know, <clears throat> just I, because the atmosphere dies, it's yeah. like everything gets so quiet and you can't see all the things that you normally seen. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's like, things start to bother you. Like for me, it drives me nuts when I, I get the, oncoming runner's headlamp just blinding me and it's like <laughs> i want to say something but i'm trying to be you know cool about it yeah uh, you know because i'll look down so i can still see where i'm going to not blind them but it's like they don't make the connection of it a little courtesy um, but yeah i get you, I get you. you know, <laughs> and then usually by then you're starting to get sleepy yeah you know because obviously it's dark that's going to have an effect on you you're tired you've been out there usually at that point it's been 12 14 plus hours you know, depending on what time it starts. Mm -hmm. Um, So the fatigue and all that, it basically, it was more for me, the pain, because I was still pushing through. Um, One of the mistakes I made was I was, because I'm so used to being down here and sweating as much, Mm -hmm. I was taking a lot of um, uh, hammer and dura lights Mm -hmm. and pickle juice, things that were helping with cramps and stuff like that. But I was Mm -hmm. taking in so much sodium that as the night came and it got I don't want to say cooler, but it wasn't as hot. I still was taking those things and it was causing me to swell because now I wasn't, I was retaining all this water and not sweating it out. 
So now my feet were like balloons. My <laughs> knees were killing me from being at that point, you know, 10 to 15 miles farther than I've ever gone before. Yeah. Um, I get to the end of the loop and I remember telling my wife and my sister, they were my crew for that. And I said, uh, I'm going to try to lay down and, and rest for a little bit, maybe sleep a little bit and see how I feel. Uh -huh. And as my body just relaxed, it was like the pain got worse. Oh. And yeah, everything. I mean, my body temperature felt like it was going up. Um, mentally, I was like, this is stupid. Like, I've already got a PR. I've ran 100K. I've never done that before. Like, <laughs> you start you start trying to find all the reasons to quit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another thing was I, I realized I still had enough time. Because, again, that's, this race gives you 40 hours. So I was like, so you know what? Technically, I'm done. I gave my sister the stuff to give to the race director. Mm -hmm. Let them know I'm dropping out. Uh -huh. uh, which they were even shocked. We went back home, uh, not home. We went to the hotel. Mm -hmm. I took a shower. I could barely sleep just because the pain, you know, you're tossing and turning. But I got a decent amount of sleep. Got up. My sister went and got me Burger King because, you know, you're running that far. You're just yeah. starting to you're get hungry. whatever you can. Um, and my friend who was crewing his girlfriend, who uh -huh. was running it too, um, she ended up dropping out early and they came to see how I was doing and realized I had dropped. Mm -hmm. So they said, Hey, we, you know, we have these, uh, these air compression sleeves that'll help flush out a lot of junk. You know, at least you can enjoy the rest of your vacation before you yeah. go home. So it wasn't even to, to go back and run. It was more just, they didn't want me sitting in the hotel room for the rest of my vacation. So mm -hmm. They set this thing up in the in the parking lot, and all, you know all these people are looking at us weird, and um, it's it's pretty nasty. I couldn't see it, thankfully. Um, doesn't really gross me out, but I probably wouldn't <laughs> want to see. But as the as the sleeve was compressing my legs and everything, it, it has an opening um, so your feet can your toes can stick out. Okay they were looking down and said all the blisters were just popping oh. <laughs> and and he my friend he was like yeah i'm definitely cleaning this when we're done because <laughs> like it's just you know i can't imagine what it looked like it was a mess oh it was God. it was nasty and i could feel it like i could <laughs> it was it, was, it, it, it wasn't even painful at that point because the compression was almost putting my legs asleep oh. um because of how swollen they were yeah and as it was going on, I, I, I went to wiggle my toes and I said, wow, I can wiggle my toes because I couldn't do that. And then I said, all right, let me bend my ankles. I could do that. So I said, take this, take this thing off me real quick. So we yeah. unzipped it and I took my feet off the chair that it was elevated on. And I was like, okay, I can bend my knee. I said, hold on, get up. I can move. Yeah. I, looked at, I looked at the watch. I'm like, and, I, and it, being any husband realizes this. I looked at my wife and I said, can I go back out there? <laughs> she was probably already planning to enjoy the rest of the day and actually chill out and not have to do work for me. Um, she gave me the green light. So I hopped in their, uh, their van while my wife and my sister started gathering all my stuff again, uh -huh. figuring, all right, we got to go back out there. <laughs> so they're gathering all the stuff. I hop in my friend's uh, van. He gives me a singlet because all my stuff, I pretty much just tossed in the in the tub. Uh -huh. They gave me socks. They gave me a, a singlet. Um, what's, a, what's a singlet? You mean uh, just like the tank top? Just like oh, okay, top. okay. Running yeah. yeah. Um, and it was just a walk fest for the last. Like I mentally knew, okay, I, I can't run. I physically just, you yeah. know. You plus, beat. I didn't. I didn't want to make it any worse. I'm like, if I can maintain this pace, I'm gonna meet the cutoff no reason to stress it out just okay. let's finish and then as you're pulling up back to the property and i'm seeing people still out there grinding and i'm thinking man i was just i took a shower sleeping in ac got a nice breakfast these guys have been out here grinding all day all night that brought some motivation back to me so i i ended up finishing um and it was painful but <laughs> It was that race that taught me I could push through anything. If if I just, if I talk myself out of the negativity, you know, anything truly is possible 
within your physical uh, abilities. You kind of have to just block that other voice out sometimes and kind of, hey, you don't you you know what you're talking about. You got to keep going. Just you're here, finish it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because my thing is, if you can still, if you can walk, just keep walking. Okay. You know, it's, you're still moving. Any time that you're moving compared to just sitting down and laying down, whatever, mm-hmm. you're, you're maintaining where all those breaks start to add up. You don't realize it, but you're like, oh, it's only five minutes, 10 minutes here. That stuff starts adding up because then you look at the, the clock and you're like, man, where'd that time go? Yeah. So you stop, yeah. you stop you can for, walk, walk. You stop for 10 minutes every, every 12 or every hour for 12 hours. It's two hours worth of breaking, you know? So you don't even, yeah, it adds up pretty quick. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Oh my God. What a story. For, and that was the Wildcat 100? Yeah. yeah. That was your first 100? first 100 and and it's funny too because there were a couple other guys that had been out there that was their first or they had attempted it before and and quit and they were now finishing for the first time so it was it was actually nice because even though it was a lot emptier than it was the day before Uh because most people had finished at that point again you come back and now you're seeing people that you didn't even know up until that point and now everyone's like oh you're back. Like one, one person was actually <laughs> excited. I was back. They were like, I've been looking for you all night. I didn't see you. I didn't, I didn't hear you. I figured you finished. I was like, I wish, but you know, it's <laughs> like they're an old uh, friend that you haven't seen in a while, you know? <laughs> exactly. And, and that's what, I mean, I made so many friends just from that race alone. Cause you go on the Facebook group and you're all, Oh, I remember you. I remember. So yeah, it's, that was, that was brutal. I think suffering really brings people. If you share a suffering with someone that really brings that relationship a lot closer together. Yeah, yeah definitely. For sure. Um, uh, yeah, so um, it's funny we're talking to the, when we did the skydive ultra, we, we were talking to some uh, people who have done ultra marathons in the past. And it seems like after you do your first one, it's almost like a chain reaction where you just kind of you do another one. How, how long was it after you did your first hundred miler where you were like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so the rule is um, after you do a race, stay off ultra sign up, stay off the internet. <laughs> um, <sighs> I hate to say it, but it wasn't even, I think 10 days. What? After I ran that, uh, I signed up for to come back to Wildcat again. I oh signed up because then I was like, "All right, I got a year now to prepare. I know oh, what I'm yeah. doing." Okay. Um, that was originally the plan, but then I started signing up for other ones in, in between that. Um, <laughs> but it's you know everyone makes fun of me about this. Where you know when I did the first fifty k, I was like, "That's it. I'm never doing anything else." And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, sure." And and you believe it. Yeah. But then next thing you know, you sign up for a fifty. And if you, you finish that and you're like, that's it. Then you sign up for hundreds. I feel like hundreds are definitely my limit. Yeah. That's as far as I want to push myself. I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could do more, but yeah. I don't have that desire. Something about a hundreds. I just like, it's just enough for me. Yeah. It's just good... enough pain and torture. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot out of it already. I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I say for sure, try to stay off of any running, and well, it's tough because you're even your social That's media. It's it. just <laughs> you're gonna be once the pain starts going away and that excitement comes back, you're like, okay. And then you start looking for races. It's like quick, cut one? off the internet. <laughs> What's the next one? <laughs> man oh man that's that's it's it's cool and it's scary at the same time but you gotta you gotta love the challenge or you gotta love the experience in general yeah but um and uh i wanted to go over like what like for your first one was the vista view the 50k yeah 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 what was that like what was your process your mindset going into that how you kind of laid out like a training schedule or did did you just kind of put your hands up in the air and just go for runs whenever so that one's actually, it's a six hour race uh-huh. um, It's from 6 a.m. to noon. Mm-hmm. Um, typically it's, it's because it's in January, it's fairly cooler in the morning and then it warms up a little bit towards the end. So that one's not as hard temperature wise, at least for me. Uh, the Where was that? Two, Where was that at in Tennessee? Oh uh, no, this is in um, like Davie, Florida, Western oh. Florida, um, kind of like the South Broward area. Okay. Western. Um, it's on an old dump. They turned it. In, they turned it into a, a trail. Oh, that's so awesome. it, it, it has elevation because it, you know, 
all the trash just build those things up from all the trash <laughs> uh, so i had run it before just going out there training that's the only place you really can get hill training down here mm-hmm. and my goal was to hit a 50k mm-hmm. i figured you know based on my marathon times i should be able to do you know a 50k distance within that six hours um and because it that one's only a mile in a it's like a mile and a quarter loop mm-hmm. um so you know they have the aid station set up there and everyone else has their stuff set up there the nice thing with that is it's as you're coming the start finish line area they also have a relay race so it's just oh uh, wow there's <laughs> so much excitement and chaos going on there yeah. that no matter how tired you are as you're coming through the, about to end and start the next loop yeah. you just get motivation because everyone's cheering and you almost think it's for you and, <laughs> and because i'm pretty well known down here uh, especially from working in the running store for so long so many people do know me and would actually cheer me through as i went so it was like oh that's fun man it yeah, was you get a little- motivation yeah it's it's fun until you leave that you're like <laughs> You're a quarter mile into the loop and now it's like, you want to go back. It's like, you can, you can still hear them behind you celebrating. It's like, ah, so as you're getting, coming back around, you hear it again and it picks you back up. Um, So it was more just same thing. It's like, you know, it's, it's how I came up with the name from the podcast as other people saying it. you just, you run the mile that you're in. Okay. Um, Because if you, which I make the mistake and I focus on the long stuff, you know, mile one of the one I did two weeks ago, I said, 99 to go. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. you it's, know, as long as you can remind yourself, Hey, look, just get through this mile. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, if, if it's a loop course, you start picking things out, like get to that tree at wildcat. The first year there was this huge spider and it was like, all right, if I make it to that spider, I know I'm at the halfway point of this uh, loop. And as long as I see the spider up there, I know it's not roaming around here. So that, so it's like things you do, um, you know, just to get through and just to keep your mind going almost to kind of, yeah. So you're not focusing on this, this long daunting path that you have to be on for the next 12 or 24 hours. Right. <laughs> That's exactly. crazy, man. Oh my God. Um, could you describe a little bit like what you uh, bring equipment wise for that kind of stuff? Like what were you, uh, what were you kind of doing? Like, for, especially for your first ultra where we we didn't know what to have on us like we knew we did a little bit of research like goos and stuff like that and some of the gel packets and maybe like dried fruit and stuff the like salt that tablets yeah. salt tablets uh, right. what was what was your what did you have on your what, what did you think you needed compared to what you carry on you now so i think what really benefited me is um the website i've had since kind of right around i started running mm-hmm. i i interview a lot of elite sub elite type runners uh-huh. um, a lot of ultra runners and i discovered um the ginger runner i don't know if you guys ever heard yeah. about him yeah. what's Definitely, his um his real name is ethan newberry but okay. um if you google the ginger runner yeah. i mean this guy's huge now wow. at this point um he, he Wait, does he have a does he have a beard too uh he might have started growing one re- it's like a short one though it's not yeah. like mine yeah, no, you got it. He's very impressive. That's, <laughs> that's, that's trademarked right there, I think. Um, but he he he's done a lot of uh, documentaries. Yeah. Like he does really nice work. Wow. Um, and he's done videos on some of the other run elite runners that have done these ultras. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would watch those and and pick their brains. Or I go uh, YouTube uh, Keys One Hundred and was looking at what people were doing and what they were bringing. Um, someone who I consider a friend and vice versa, Mike Wardian. Um, he, he would, I, he allowed me to pick his brain personally uh-huh. for a lot of tips and suggestions, a uh, real humble guy. Mm-hmm. So I kind of took all that and just put together kind of like you said, like the, the goose, um, salt tablets and Duralites. Um, but I've realized for me, it's more food. Like, there's a certain point you're not going to want the gels. Uh-huh. You're not going to, you're going to want salt from other things. So you start getting hungry and eating random things. So I brought a lot of fruit and I'm a big soda drinker. Okay. So I was bringing a lot of soda that was helping with like the sodium, but even just making me feel full from like that carbonation mentally. I like soda 
so, so every time I was like, okay, I can get another soda as soon as I finish this loop, <laughs> <laughs> things nice. like that. Um, for me, I bring it as an emergency now. I haven't needed it as much because mm. I've figured out nutrition for the most part, but pickle juice was something everyone told me because as nasty as it is, you drink some of that cramps go for away. the most part, go away right away. Um, I, uh, you know, a, a lotion I use, PR lotion, um, that helps with kind of keeping the legs feel fresh. Mm -hmm. So just products, it's, it's all testing. You really, what works? I don't think you? I've brought everything each race. It's always, you're, you're picking and choosing different things that didn't work last time, but I'll still bring it just in case because okay. things that you think you're going to want, you end up not wanting because mentally you, you feel sick just thinking about eating it or you yeah. start to eat it and you, you feel that way. So it's just whatever you want initially. And then as the race goes on, you take whatever you can tolerate. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah, no, definitely. We've been, we've been kind of like, especially compared to when we did our 50 K and then when we did the ultra, we kind of adjust yeah. what we had on us and what we wanted to take. Um, I went from doing the, the, especially like something to have water on you. I went with the camel pack for the first time. And then I just, I got too much chafing around my arms and stuff like that. So I decided to kind of look for like an alt alternative source. Nick went with the handheld bottle this, when we did the 50K. Do you use that? I use the handheld because I, the least amount of stuff I have to carry, the better is my, for yeah. me. Yeah. I, I got, I never had the handheld, but I, I do want to try that. I ended up getting like a fanny pack almost that had like a, like a carrier for like two little nine ounce water bottles. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a cool, like I could keep like, you know, some goose in the fanny pack and my phone or like for music or whatever, and then have the two water bottles right there. You know, it was, it was a good situation, but is there anything that you've, you've definitely, you're set on like compared to like maybe like a 50 mile, if you were going to do like a 50 miler, compared to a hundred, would you stick with like, is there a preference? Like, would you have your camel pack on you or handheld? Or you just always stick with the handheld at this point. I always stick with the handheld cause it's, it's, it's worked for me. Uh, I tried a few different, um, uh, ultra vests, mm -hmm. especially cause when I was at the running store, a lot of the brands, you know, they're, they're wanting you to promote their products. So they would give me test products all the time. And, within a mile i'm like dude, I, I can't just, yeah. it's just annoying yeah. um so i found that the the handheld really works for me because you can switch it hand to hand or if you don't want to actually have the strap around your hand then you just hold it in your hand you can hold it a few different ways um so it's more just no matter the distance really the only time i don't bring anything is like a marathon under because you know every mm -hmm. mile you have something but um in 50 Ks and, and up the eight stations aren't always going to be, you know, one mile apart. Sometimes they're three, four, five, you know, and yeah. even if you typically, like I could typically go that far without needing anything. You never know. There's been times I, I'm like, ah, oh, I got 90% in my handheld and mm -hmm. I get halfway through to the next eight station. I'm like, I should have topped off, even though it's <laughs> maybe a couple ounces. It's like, yeah. I'm drinking more than I expected to. And now it's like, you're dying for the next age they should. So um, it's, you know, whatever, whatever works for you, really, you, you have to Preference. play around with it and find it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause like what I did, my method was like, I wanted to have wanted to do, cause I had about 18 to 20 ounces on me with the fanny pack, which, which was like a good situation to have water. I didn't want to have too little, but I ended up like going around the seven mile loop at the and ended up having a little bit of more water on me. And I was like, well, I really didn't need this much. But I mean, I felt a little bit more prepared that I had it. But knowing now that I can go a little bit farther without so much water, or maybe I would every 10 to 15 minutes, I would give myself a squirt just to kind of give myself something to work with, you know, but it, it was yeah. Yeah, ended up working out. And that's the nice thing with like um, skydive because they, you know, it's right there in the middle. Yeah. So you know, you're like, okay, if you get halfway, you refill and then halfway back and, and then you get your stuff. Yeah. So, and you could even um, leave your stuff there at, in the halfway point too, if you want it. So, so yeah, it's, it's, I feel like the handheld works for me. It gets me far enough into it. Um, and another example was the keys where 
I, at that point, I put my uh, debit card. Uh-huh. I brought it with me in the little zipper pouch. And there were a couple of times where it was a long gap between the next aid station. There's a corner store, run in, grab, yeah. grab yeah. something and head back out. So, you know, having my card with me, I could, I could create eight stations along, along that, the hundred miles of the keys. I like that about the, the keys 100. You can kind of, you have your own little eight stations along the way, you know, it's, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. cool. Damn. Yeah. That's, that, that definitely makes me want to do that a little bit more. It yeah. seems like you're more, it seems like a benefit to that race a little bit, especially that the terrain's mostly like a road, right? You're, you're on the road pretty much the whole time. Uh, road and sidewalk. Yeah. Cause it's, um, they, they encourage you to stay on the sidewalk, but if you're in the bike path, you're, you're technically on the road. So you're, it's, it's softer and that adds up over time. You start feeling difference. Um, that, that asphalt feels a lot softer as the distance goes on. Um, and the bridges aren't really that bad. Um, cause most, they're so quick that, you know, for me it wasn't much of a problem i just walked up the top of it and then ran the flat and down and the down was nice because it kind of pushes you through some more so okay, it's really to too hard it's like <laughs> to kick your legs right up. yeah it's just getting through because it's during you know the the heat of the summer yeah. so it's it's brutally hot for sure and i, I oh you were saying? there you go uh, I remember there was a something uh, about like in one of your podcasts, you had a, uh, difficulties when you were running the keys 100 about the, when it came to nighttime, they have to make sure that you have like, when you reach your checkpoint, there was a, there was an issue with like at nighttime when you had to have like your night gear on. Yeah. So for security reasons, you have to have, uh, you know, full body visibility front and back, um, plus your headlamp or mm-hmm. handheld lamp, you know, something so you could see as well. I had plotted everything out based on my, my pace. So I had a drop bag at every 20 miles. Um, nobody told me there was a mile 50. They just, you know, up to the, even the information on the site just said mm. every 20 miles. If I had known that I would have put my night gear at 50. Yeah. Um, just because the way things were going, you know, again, making a lot of mistakes without having a crew. I, I started doing the math in my head and I said, I have this much time to get to mile 60 where my night gear is uh-huh. and i'm at that point you're racing the sun oh god um, so i started pushing myself harder than i wanted to during uh-huh. the w- hottest part of the day <laughs> to make that cutoff and i was from 53 to 60 is the seven mile bridge um, okay. once you're on that you know even even if you miss the cutoff you have to finish it like there's no the they can't stop and pick you up. Yeah. Like it's just too dangerous. So there's cars coming and everything. Yeah. So I knew as long as I can make it to the bridge, uh-huh. even if it was getting dark enough, like I had my stuff there, I could convince them, Hey, I'm, I can continue now. My stuff is there. So I was just <laughs> pushing through and, and that's what I, I just remember coming down the last part of that hill and I could see one of the race marshals and he's just locked in on me. There's some <laughs> other people around, but he sees me because they have their stuff and he just sees this dark figure and he yells out uh, almost like he felt like he was concerned. He said, please tell me you have your, your night gear here. And I said, yes, it's in my orange bag. I do. He goes, oh, thank God. Because he, you know, I think he could see it in, in my eyes that I was just trying to make that cut off. Can they disqualify my... you like that if you don't, if you don't have it? Yeah. For safety reasons, they'll, they'll oh. pull you out. And at that point, I guess what they would do is make you wait until sunrise, but now you're losing. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot of time, man. Whoa. I, Cause then you still got 40 to go. So unless, yeah, I, I feel like if you get there, there's no way you're going to be able to finish because yeah. the time just is against you. Yeah. Um, but that putting that extra effort in made the rest of the race just miserable because now I beat myself <laughs> up more than yeah. I expected to. And, uh. and then that just starts to make you make more mistakes again without having a crew. So you forget something and it's like, am I going to go back and add another two miles or just push through into the next eight stations? So. No, I, I can't believe you. You're not saying that's your hardest race. That seems like, like a hell of a time, man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It was, I think the, the, the scariest part was, um, 
because you'll start to like, especially skydive. I definitely did it in skydive uh, <laughs> because of how much walking was required because of just the, the floods from the, from the storm. Oh my, there's a whole patch of sand right there. The sugar oh, sand and that's, that must've been that. Oh was, my God. Every, it got to the point where you, there was only the road when you come to the, that little diamond shaped road at mm-hmm. the end and the start, that was the only dry, everything else was just puddles. You were always ankle deep. It was, I'm telling you, it was flooded. The, you get trench foot that way. Oh my as God. You're going, as you're going towards that main road, that one stretch of sand that's yeah. kind of angled. It, if you stepped, you slid. It, oh. it, you know, it was just, you had to walk for safety reasons. So yeah. you start almost sleepwalking. <laughs> and in the Keys, that yeah. was starting to happen to me. And I'll, I'll never forget it. It, it was a, a, an older guy and woman that had now passed me and it was like, okay, now I have something to at least focus on. There's, there's people in front of me and you try to talk to them to stay awake. I start falling asleep again. Cause I kept dozing into the road. Whoa. I'd wake up, <laughs> you know, and, and be out oh, and get back into the bike lane. Yeah. At some point, this truck, whether he was just being a jerk, trying to be funny, the drunk driver, or maybe he was falling asleep. Yeah. One of the three comes into the bike lane where them two and the three of us are walking and the guy in front of me pushes the woman into the grass so that they're both you know Mm. safe i now am waking up from a who knows how many seconds sleep and i see these (laughs) headlights coming towards me and i like jump and it was just like that woke me up for about 10 or 15 minutes now your heart's like yeah (laughs) um it was was like that you drain yourself. I drained myself so much that now I was even more tired, uh, you know, going through the night and you're seeing, uh, I counted about 20, 30 deer. Um, really? cause there's a whole stretch where there's a lot of deer. They have signs up deer crossing and, and you see the, you see the eyes on the water side and you're like, as long as that's a deer and not a gator, I'm good. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> I saw, so I don't know if I hallucinated or whatever, but on the last lap I saw, you know, where you have that, that, the there's like that um canal right there when you're coming off where where you're right to the left of you is the sugar cane and then the canal to the right of you um i saw on the last lap it had to be like 11 o'clock at night these two eyes and i I put my light over there and uh it it looked like at least like a 30 or 40 pound cat there i saw because of the the rain and the mud that was created Mm -hmm. um there were what looked like definitely like some kind of bobcat or something prints oh man uh, yeah because same thing like i you know you start you hear the rustling from those uh sugarcane like branches and everything and you yeah. start getting paranoid you're looking <laughs> and i remember you know what you what i do because i have the headband is quickly you're like trying to identify what it is yeah. and i seen a body of something which when i looked down and saw the prints i'm like that's not a dog no, that's no. that's something else and now I'm hugging the lake yeah. and still walking like this, like trying to keep my light in that area, but stay on path. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, you will hear and see some things as well in these, but yeah, out there, you don't, who knows? Part of the, part of the sport, I guess it's the, that's the risk that you take. <laughs> oh gosh, man. Yeah. That's crazy. Ah, that was definitely a very unique race. And I think that's what kind of drew us t- towards it a little bit, but uh, that, that definitely was a real fun one. I, I liked how it, I thought that kind of like the skydive would have been a disadvantage at the beginning. Cause it would have been like, you're draining all this adrenaline out that you're probably going to need during the race. But I mean, it, I, and a lot of people were telling us that, but I don't, it didn't, affect me too much i don't know how how that kind of did that did you feel that kind of like took away from the experience a little bit or added to it so i didn't actually i chose not to do the skydive Mm -hmm. um more for the financial reasons yeah it was like do you really need to pay that for that i was like no not really (laughs) i wanted to but um so i didn't do it but also because of the weather they actually mm -hmm. they didn't even get to do it on the first for the start Mm -hmm. um as we were finishing our first loop, all of a sudden we see people skydiving. They're coming <laughs> down and the race director was telling all of us, anyone who had signed up could do it if they want. One guy did. The rest were like, no, forget it. At that point, why stop? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 
throughout the day, that was fun because you're doing the loop, you hear the plane and now you know, okay. And you're looking and you're watching them. It's cool <laughs> um, to see. It's like while you're running, yeah, it's, it's something else to look at. <laughs> but by day two, it was just so nasty. They, they couldn't. So that was another mental like disadvantage. It's like, Oh, I don't have that to look at. And for me, the worst part of it was because of how cold it was, it was still in the fifties uh -huh. with that. Um, you know, a lot of people had to keep changing clothes as much as possible to stay dry, stay warm. Mm -hmm. I remember with, I had two loops to go. Um, and I was in the, coming towards the end of the loop and the loudest lightning strike oh my thunder I've ever heard. Yeah. All of a sudden I had, the ability to run now I'm <laughs> here for my life and i know i'm close so i'm taking off and and i get to the end now i don't know it looked like you guys might have had a slightly different setup than us mm -hmm. i think because of the storm they moved um like the timing and everything into where you would actually go to register and, and skydiving like that building yeah was kind of yeah they did move off the, the, ha the hangar yeah, yeah right by the hangar yeah, yeah. so our so we actually had even longer because if you wanted to go to the A station, you had to go out that way and come back. Oh my you couldn't gosh. just keep going through the loop. Um, I went in there just to get shelter. Yeah. And that. once I stopped moving, the race director, Eric, who's a great guy, he, yeah. he was like, dude, I got to warm you up. Like you look <laughs> like you're getting hypothermic. Yeah. You know, it was bad. And oh there's God. pictures of me bundled up. They're, they're giving me ramen noodles, hot chocolate, um, <laughs> like anything hot. Just And I'm sitting in front of this heat lamp, um, you know, just trying to warm up. And thankfully, that was right around sunrise. So even though now it's still rainy and cloudy, there's light mm -hmm. and the lightning had went away. So I battled that even, you know, I'm used to the heat. Now here I am just trying to stay warm because yeah. it was you're soaked and you're freezing. Wow, man, that's, that's, yeah, that's definitely a big, com a completely different experience to what we had. But I mean, I feel like the fact that you had these miles under your bed and that, what, what, uh, what hundred miler was that for you? Was that your second or third? I want to, yeah. Um, yeah. Second. Okay. Okay. So you, you already had that under your belt a little bit, but still you were kind of new to it a little bit, but still, I mean, that, that seems like it was a cool a cool experience because you got through that challenge and now you know that well if i got through the first two like your first hundred was it seemed like it was a crazy experience and then the second one it seemed like it was an even crazier experience mm -hmm. and then you know your third one was probably like oh i could do 100 miles <laughs> <laughs> that's nuts man yeah but uh do you have any uh any dream races that you want to do like or a location day or area or uh, a certain spot that you really want to do or uh, something that you've got your eye on? I'm not sure I could even finish it mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the, the elevation and the, the 30 hour cutoff time and just the conditions being totally different. But because of long haul, I qualified for Western States. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I qualified with a lot of like that race. You have to, the cutoff um, or to qualify you have to run under 30 and i ran under 27 Whoa, so nice man so it, it gave me confidence like okay i'm getting better at this yeah. um you know i just qualified for western states but it's such a hard race to get into and then they had to cancel this year's because of the situation with the yeah. virus so now it's like my chances of getting in next year i don't even know if i will if they're gonna have a lottery or if it gets mm -hmm. so uh I would love to do that even if I, you know, didn't finish it, but just to be a part of that race and experience it as much as I could, as far as I could go to me would be, would be really cool just because it's, it's the Boston marathon of ultra running. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I mean, isn't the, um, isn't the Moab 240 like one of the big like elite running, you know, Western state for, or Western state runs for like ultra marathon runners? Uh, I, I know a little bit about that race. Again, once it goes over a hundred, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a friend who, who actually did it. Um, and then a couple weeks later, tried to run long haul and it just, it, it was, it wasn't happening. 
Um, he actually thinks he might have had an early case of of COVID, to be honest, because uh, he had he had the symptoms that they've described. So he's wondering if maybe that's what he had as well. Um, have you guys have you guys been? I mean, you and your family any any issues with that? We're we're good because we've we're we're for the most part sticking to the rules. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, we're we're being safe about it, especially with a one year old son. So you yeah. know, we're trying to keep him protected. But it must have been a little uh, bit scary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's 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 one of those where that race it's such a multi day type race mm-hmm. um for most people that it's that's I don't even know how to describe that in in a five K to a hundred um uh, or a marathon type distance, but yeah, it's that's the elite that's bigger. Yeah. 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 So for the western states you, you mentioned that you have to get you said under thirty hours for a hundred miler? So it depends on the race because some, um, some it's even, I seen like 28, like if you go on their website, uh, the only things I really remember is it has to be, I think like 90% trail. Mm -hmm. Um, and depending on the weather elevation and those factors, they determine what would translate into running that race. Um, and that's the thing I've seen, I've watched that race so many times through their streams and Twitter feeds and everything it's so much harder than long haul. So the fact that they've said, if you can do 30 hours here, you qualify for a race. And I had three hours plus extra. It gave me the confidence that maybe I can do this. And Mm -hmm. I would just have to go out to Vista view and run that hill (laughs) day and night just to get used to climbing. But yeah. So um, do you, do you like, is it like an application type process? And then they pick the ones they, they want. Like how does that work for, for Western States? From what I've seen and heard, it's um, there's like levels. So f- um, you get like a imaginary ticket, basically. Yeah. Um, so the more tickets you get, the more op- chances you can yours is going to get pulled. Uh, and then they try to balance it. It looks like so each you know one year, two year, three year. They and then I think it's like seven plus is grouped into one category. So there's been people that have waited six, seven, eight, you know, so many years. Um, and then there's people that get in on their first year. So that's insane. Oh, those yeah, so <laughs> my hope was, my hope was if I can get in this one time, cause I don't know how long I'm going to have this desire to yeah. do it. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's luck of the draw really. You yeah. gotta hope you get pulled. Oh mm. man. Cool. Oh. Is there anything you're, um, any races you, you, you're, that's coming up for you? Anything that you're training for or, um, wildcat. This will be round three. Oh, wow. Good luck. <laughs> um, when is that one again? Uh, Labor Day weekend. So, oh, okay, cool, man. Yeah. So we'll be doing that. The race director just uh, told everybody, hey, as of right now, the race is still on. Yeah. Um, we'll, you know, the rules will be slightly different, you know, maybe staggered starts and things like that because of what's going on and, you know, masks at certain points when you have to interact with the crew or the the aid stations and things like that um that and then this is where i don't know how it's going to happen mm-hmm. but i think three weeks later i signed up for the miami 100 mm-hmm. okay, um, yeah. which is like an adventure race yeah so it is a research, yeah it is an out and back but y- each checkpoint they give you a map of where to go that is cool um, so that's going to be I know I could do it, but the fact that I'm doing a hundred a couple weeks before that is going to be a whole new territory. But it's a race I'm going into, telling myself there's a chance you're you're going to finally drop out of a hundred miler, and I'm okay with that. It's more yeah. of just you've done these at that point. That'll be the eighth eighth one I'll be trying. I'll be okay. I'll be less frustrated and disappointed if I drop out because I've you- done enough and. Yeah you've definitely proven that you have the ability and the resiliency to do that and putting yourself in a situation where you're going to be obviously tired from two weeks before, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, how long do you normally give yourself like in your head? Like, would you say like would be a good resting time between those type of runs? You know, they, they say, I think it's like for every mile, you're supposed to give yourself a day from racing. Okay. So you could still go out and, and, go for a run but you don't want to go at your like race pace Mm -hmm. um here i am this morning still struggling 
you know, I've done a couple runs and it's just, I'm lucky if I can get a mile without having to, to walk just cause my lungs are still just not, my yeah. legs feel okay, but it's just like my lungs don't feel as good. And maybe it could be the extra time off, but typically I've noticed I start feeling myself again after about four or five weeks of oh, just, oh, that, wow. just that crappy running where I'm having to walk more than I normally do and slowly building my lungs back up and then, then I'm back to normal. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm, my only guess of what I could try to do is between the pool, like swimming in a pool uh -huh. and getting on my bike just to try to keep my lungs working mm -hmm. and stay off my feet between that time. Cause that's going to be, and the it's going to be quicker. Yeah. The water and the bike is, I think that's a really good recovery cause it's not, it's not really affecting your joints that much. And it's probably helping them out, loosen them up a little bit and keep that like, at least your muscles strengthen up in those areas. Yeah. I feel like it's definitely a good, I would, yeah, I'm probably going to try to do that. That seems like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anywho, man, I don't, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but it's been a while, man. <laughs> this is our first, well, you are our first official guest, just to let you know. I'm really, oh, really okay, appreciate cool. you yeah. coming on. Grateful, man. It was really good talking to you. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I got your message, uh, I was like, uh, it's like me? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just like, some right, cool, kids trying to learn how to run, man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. And, and right. that's, that's where I would, I would definitely say um, – you know, the, the uh, website I have, mm -hmm. heelstriker954.com. Mm -hmm. I interview people from 100 meter sprinters to people that have done Moab and, oh. and Badwater and these um, longer distance races. And I, tr you know, I ask a lot of them the same questions just to see how each person compares. Mm -hmm. um, but then I throw in some other questions and depending on races they've experienced um, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of athletes I've interviewed, runners, that you could even go in there and read some of their workout tips or, you know, things that they do that works for them okay. that you might say, let me try that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's, I do that for people like me and you that are out there looking for the information. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a place where you can pick the brains of some of the best in the world. Cause I don't just interview people from the U S I interview all over. Cause you know, the terrains are going to be pretty much similar depending where your race is yeah. and different, different ways of doing it, different preferences, how people, you know, you try to get that different mindset or maybe something else might work for you or something might be a little bit better. Or this guy might have a good idea, you know? Yeah. It's, it's right. I like it. I like it. But uh, is there any other, uh, any uh, plugs you want to give yourself or the mile or the mile you're in podcast? Uh, go ahead and listen to that. And uh, where can people find you on uh, Instagram and, and like Twitter, if you have one or Facebook? Everything, everything is at heelstriker954.com. I was able to keep it simple with a unique name like that. So uh, if you go to the website, the, the podcast is there. Like everything is mainly on the website. Mm -hmm. It keeps it easier for people to find social media, the podcast. Um, but yeah, the website is heelstriker954.com. And the podcast is The Mile You're In. And that's on pretty much the main, you know, Apple Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and I think something else. I don't know. Whatever the host has uh, deals with. Yeah. Sweet, man. Well, thank you. Really, seriously, we're really grateful for you being on and, and talking to us. It really was fun. Yeah, thank you, man. Maybe we'll see you out on a run one of these days. I hope so. Man. <laughs> I, I, would, I do want to go back and do skydive mm -hmm. um, with better weather. So yeah. maybe I'll see you guys out there one day too. Awesome, man. Yeah, keep in touch. Keep in touch. All right, man. Have a good right, one. All right. Take care. Thanks.